Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. And if you're, uh, if you're watching online, hey, what's up, online church? Glad you're here, too. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm really excited to wrap up this series with you. Uh, today's message is really personal for me. Uh, but before we get into the actual meat of the message, I want to unpack for you why it's personal for me. So my name's Kevin. I grew up in church, in this church specifically. Uh, my parents were a big part of this church becoming what it was, and uh, I was here a lot. I mean, there are probably people in this room that I've known for 25 years, um, some of you will bump into me in the lobby and remind me that you used to change my diaper. And I don't know why we're still talking about that. I don't think, I don't think we need to talk. I think we're good on that. But I was raised in this church. I went to Christian school. Um, and then I went, I went away to college. I went to UCLA. And I became best friends with a lot of people who weren't raised like I was raised. And then I entered the workforce and I got really close with a lot of other people who don't really want to hang out in a place like this, wouldn't feel comfortable in a place like this. Don't believe the same things I believe. But they're some of my best friends and I love them. And, and my journey from this bubble, this comfortable, happy little bubble where everything makes sense to me, out into relationship with people that I love that aren't in that bubble, um, I started looking at Christianity through their eyes and through their experiences. And, and to be honest, I, I didn't usually like what I saw. We would have like deep heart to hearts about this stuff. And they would ask me questions like, dude, so are you telling me this is like 2 a.m., I'm 19, down at school with my best friends that I live with. So are you telling me that in order to be a part of your thing, I have to ignore just the, the mountains of scientific evidence that point to where we came from and how long we've been here? Or they'd say, dude, I, I was raised with a little bit of a church background too, and are you telling me that you, when you read the Old Testament and then the New Testament, you don't sense some conflict there. You don't see that it feels a little different. This all just works for you. And they would say like, so are you, you telling me in order to be a part of your thing, I have to follow all, all of the rules, even the old ones and the new ones. And some of them seem to almost contradict each other. And so really like you're telling me all of that works for you. They couldn't see Jesus past all of the obstacles that had been placed in their way. And then on top of that, too often their experiences with Christians had just been riddled with hypocrisy or with a really small, petty gospel about behavior change where the difference between me and you is that I say freaking. <laughs> Who cares? The difference between my marriage and your marriage is that it's pretty much exactly the same, except for we didn't live together before we were married. That's kind of it. What a boring, petty, small, uninspiring, unattractive gospel. This rules first approach didn't work, didn't land, wasn't inspiring. And so where these conversations would end inevitably was something like, hey man, I'm glad that works for you. That's cool, but like, I'm good. So you want, can we please talk about something else for the love of God or whatever? None of my training in apologetics helped. None of my scripture verses I'd memorized helped. It didn't matter that I knew the Romans road. Something about the way that we had communicated the message of Jesus to them had gotten lost in translation. So we started this whole series looking at the early church and how despite having zero advantages, no institutional support, no real influence, they didn't even have the Bible. They weren't the cool kids. They didn't have a big megaphone. 
If anything, everything was, was stacked against them. They didn't just not have institutional support, they had institutional opposition. Despite all of that, this movement from a first century backwater became the most impactful cultural force that the world has ever seen, and it's not even close. And I don't know about you, but whenever we talk about that early church and the momentum they had, and the way they were tapped into what was going on culturally, and the way they had lived out the message of Jesus, and how it resonated with the people around them, and how it spread, and how God was moving, don't you feel jealous? Don't you feel the obvious contrast to the moment we're living in today to to an American version of Christianity that feels so easy for others to ignore or resist. So today is about reaching the world with the message of Jesus. It's about taking the new covenant, which is loving God and loving others and saying, I love you enough and I love you enough that all I wanna do is just introduce you to each other. But before we get into the hopeful stuff, I wanna set the scene with the bummer stuff. So. I referenced a lot of my friends that have no desire to be a part of what we're doing here. And I think you probably have them too. And I think you probably have more of them than you had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I think we can feel that. Pastor Steve Ingold, a few weeks ago, walked us through this trend where people that self-identify as followers of Jesus, the line's going like this, and people that identify as nuns, like I'm not really a part of anything, it's going like this, and you can see the correlation between the two lines. See people moving from this line to this line. It's not news. We know it. We can feel it, but it sucks. And we need to to confront it. Because it's tempting to look at that graph, to know that's a big deal, that matters, and your instinct in that moment is, who can I blame for this? It's moral relativism. It's the decay of Western society. It's the collapse of traditional family values. It's social media. It's the Super Bowl halftime show. It's something else that's not me that I'm not to blame for. It feels better to do that. But there's a principle that I try to live by in my work life, which is that when faced with bad news, always be skeptical of convenient narratives. Basically what that means is that when you're you're faced with bad news, the way we are wired is to externalize it because confronting bad news and owning bad news and owning our part in bad news is uncomfortable and we want to move away from things that are uncomfortable. That's where our instincts take us. So always be skeptical of those convenient narratives. They might be true, they might be false. Sometimes things happen that aren't your fault. They are someone else's fault. I'm not saying it's always your fault. I'm saying you have to recognize the bias that we all already have, which moves us towards it's someone else's fault. So a better question, a more helpful question to ask here is what part of this is on us? How have we misrepresented the message of the way of love that Jesus brought? Why isn't it as attractive and winsome as it should be, as it could be? And are we taking the key, foundational, important, inextricable pieces of what it means to follow Jesus? Like in week one, when we were building that Jenga stack, the, the, just the foundation, the, much, the most important pieces of that. Have we taken that and have we packaged it with a bunch of other stuff that's less important, that's more confusing, that's more subjective? And if we said, this whole thing, this is the gospel, you have to swallow this whole thing, hook, line, and sinker, or you're not one of us. Have we been doing that? This is a question that we need to wrestle with. But I also have good news to share. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the idea of, of approval ratings. And if you're not, it's an election year, so you're going to hear about them a lot. It's basically, do I like and approve of the job that this person is doing? Kind of boils down to, do I like this person? Do I not like this person? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Pretty simple poll. And in a statistically significant representative sample of Americans, they asked for Jesus' approval rating. And Jesus comes in at 90%. That is our good news. We're going to talk about this more in a second, but for context, uh, I want to give you some other folks. So Abraham Lincoln comes in at 91%. 
So just like a little better than Jesus. The Beatles took a bunch of heat for being, uh, saying they're better, be, uh, bigger than Jesus, and it turns out, Abraham Lincoln the whole time. Uh, Mother Teresa comes in at 83%, and that's like a high number, but then I like to flip that and go, who are the 17% of people that are like, Mother Teresa, disapprove. <laughs> not my cup of tea, just her whole vibe, it's not for me, okay? the whole giving your whole life to serve the people that are the most desperate and just encouraging other people to love. I'm glad that's your thing, not my thing. Not into it. Disapprove. Santa Claus comes in at 67%, which to me is a very surprisingly high number because this is what we're saying. Hey, you know that guy who, who proudly watches you while you sleep? and then sorts all of your actions into good and bad, breaks into your house once a year, eats your food, and then takes credit for the presents you bought your kids. <laughs> Two-thirds of Americans are like, yeah, that guy. But this would not be a poll of Americans if not for the winner of the poll, which is, drum roll please, yourself at 93%. So that means that there are 2% of Americans who are like, Abraham Lincoln, nah. Have you met me, though? <laughs> Pretty good right here. And there are 10% of Americans who are like, you know who's better than Mother Teresa? Me. I'm pretty great. Anyway, back to the actual relevant part of this poll, which is this piece of good news. People love Jesus. Even people that don't know why they love Jesus. Even people who would never hang out here, even people that don't like us, even people who we've given a good reason not to like us can see past that to Jesus. Something about interacting with pure, unfiltered Jesus touches something inside of us, strikes a chord that we didn't even know was there. And the reason why is th there's this phrase in scripture that says deep calls out to deep. And when I see the results of this poll, that's what I see, the deepest part of me. We're all made in the image of God, Imago Dei. That's scripture, that's in us. The deepest, most divine part of us sees, interacts, reads Jesus and goes, I don't know why, but something's right about that. It's filling something, it's striking a chord. I can't articulate why, and I don't actually like most, most of his people, but that dude, something is there. They don't like us as much, which is not great. So here's my big takeaway. And this is what we're gonna spend the rest of our time on today. We are still figuring out how to translate the eternal, unchanging message of Jesus for this specific time and place. We're still figuring it out. And this is the challenge of every generation, translating. Because culture changes, and language changes, and priorities change, and Jesus doesn't. So one side of this equation is moving. So the bridge that was built from here to here in 1970 doesn't work anymore because one side of that bridge moved over here. And we're the ones building the bridges. We're the ones translating. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Taking something eternal and true and unchanging and not apologizing for it, not changing it, but framing it in such a way that the people that we love, the people that we've been called to can hear it and understand it. And here's a small example of translating. This is what I mean by translating. We all already do it all the time. You come home from work or you come home from school and something happened and you wanna tell someone about it. And so you're doing that thing where you're like, how do I give you the relevant details that you actually need in order to understand the point I'm trying to make or the story I'm trying to tell or the punchline that I'm trying to get to so that by the time I get there, you actually get it. You have the context that you need in order to laugh at my joke or just empathize with me because someone was being lame and I want you to understand that I had a crappy day or, or I have a question for you that I want your advice on or whatever, but I'm going to be translating my work, my school, whatever environment for you so that we can connect over this thing. You, you do it 10 times a day. My wife is a musician 
And the number of times in our marriage when she's been trying to explain something musical to me because she has a question for me or she wants me to empathize with her and she sees me just trying my best to get it and then at a certain point she sees my eyes gla glaze over and I can like watch her die inside just like a little bit as she realizes that I'm not going to be able to be helpful here as something is lost in translation. And it's not just in what we say, it's also in what we do. This was Chris's whole message last week. Chris's whole message was, what does love require is the question we ask in a particular context because I might do or say something with a particular person in a particular context that is good, that is right, that is the right thing to do. I could move into a different context, those exact same words, that exact same action could be the wrong thing to do. It's the essence of the new covenant. In the old covenant, we had all the rules. Just check all the boxes. It's just do this. There's no translating required. But in the new covenant, it's so simple. It's just love me, love each other. That's what God's saying to us. So you take this really, really simple thing, but you have to apply it to everything the way you talk and the way you act and the way you spend and the way you vote and the way you fight and the way you parent and the way you work and the way you insert verb for thing you do in life. The new covenant touches that and informs that. So if you've got to apply something really simple to something really broad and then, oh, by the way, the context is always changing. Everything's just getting more complicated and nuanced all the time. Of course we're translating. It's what the new covenant requires. And we didn't start this whole translating thing. Jesus did. The incarnation of Jesus. And incarnation is a fancy church word, and it just means took on a body. Like carne is meat. God became meat. That's incarnation. He did. I mean, it's true. Um, the incarnation of Jesus was in and of itself God translating himself for us. God became a person that we could touch that we could listen to, that we could smell, that we could hear, that we could experience in the way that we can experience things. God, who exists as this infinite thing that I can't wrap my brain around and I don't have words for, became a person with a body so that we could finally stop misunderstanding him. He translated himself. And then once he shows up, all he does is walk around pulling from the cultural, political, physical context around him to explain big, important things in ways that the people around him will get it. He wants people to understand just how big love your neighbor is so that when they say, and then so, so someone asks, well, then who's my neighbor? And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, which is an incredibly powerful story, but to us, it doesn't mean anything because we don't have any type of feelings towards Samaritans. Even when we teach this story now, there's the, hey, reminder, this, is the, this was the xenophobia and racism that existed here. That, so this is why this was such a powerful, revolutionary type of statement that would have knocked everybody on their butt. Whoa, you mean the Samaritans are my neighbor? If he showed, if he was right here and I was like, Jesus, who's my neighbor? He would not tell me the story of the good Samaritan. He was translating for those people. He's hanging out with a bunch of farmers and he wants them to understand how powerful and transformational faith can be. So he talks about a mustard seed. And he says the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds. And guess what? That's not even true. There are smaller seeds. But in that moment, Jesus isn't going, okay, so the mustard seed's really small. There are actually some smaller seeds. And in like 1,500 years, you guys are going to figure out this thing called a microscope. And you're going to be able to see things that are smaller. And actually, the seeds that are smaller, they're not even native to this region. Anyway, what was the point? Something about faith. I think faith is good. No, he's just reading the room and he's like, oh, the smallest seed you know about in your context. Let me tell you something powerful. Explain something big and important and eternal about what faith is using what's right here that you understand. He's translating. And then as Jesus gets ready to leave, He's so clear that we, his church, have inherited his power, his authority, and his responsibility, which is translating the message of the way of love for the people around us. And then thankfully, he gives us Paul, who shows us the way. So that's the text we're going to be in now. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts 13. 
we're going to walk through two sermons. We're going to walk through two completely separate, different, could not be more different translations of the same one eternal truth given to us by the same guy. The first comes to us in Acts 13. Paul is in Antioch. He's in a synagogue. And I'm not going to give you... We don't have time to go through Paul's whole amazing transformational journey, but I need to give you the cliff notes because it matters so much. Paul used to be Saul. Saul was, by all accounts, the most zealous, the most studious, the most academic, the most righteous, the most passionate articulator, defender, student of the Old Covenant. To the point that as Christianity began to take off, Paul was lit, Saul at the time, was literally facilitating the murder of Christians because of the threat it posed to the old ways and what he thought the affront to Yahweh, his God. Then he's on his way to Damascus. God knocks him down, explains himself, translates himself to Paul. And Paul's whole life flips. And what he becomes is arguably the most important translator of the good news that the world has ever had other than Jesus. So that's, that's Paul. He's now Paul. He changed his name from Saul to Paul. This is, this is who he is now. So he's in synagogue. He's with his Jewish brothers and sisters. These are his people. He's been waiting his whole life to translate this for these people. So in verse 14, we see him showing up and sitting down and listening. Which... Do, don't miss that, church. We do not show up and kick the door down and say, guess what? I've got some good news to share with you. Nobody, nobody wants to hear that. In verse 15, he's asked to say something. And then in verse 16, he begins his translation. He starts by referencing the beginnings of the Jewish faith. Guys, do you remember Abraham? Do you remember God calling us do you remember God making a people where there was no people? And then do you remember Egypt and slavery and the Exodus and then the promised land? And now we have a, a land, we have Israel and then David, our king, the hero of our faith. And then he connects the dots from David to Jesus. In this moment, he's establishing his Jewish bona fides with this group. Remember, I'm one of you. I know these stories. I've earned the right to say these things. I'm about to turn some stuff upside down, but it's not because I don't understand it. It's because I do understand it. And that's why you should listen to me. In verse 26, I, I love this. I, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend to fully understand the, what the Jewish emotional journey must have been in this time and place, but I can imagine if I'm trying to put myself in their shoes that it's a little bit complex because Yes, Jesus' message is awesome, but it was cool because we, we used to just be God's only special people. God was kind of ours and nobody else's. And then Jesus showed up and he said, yeah, it is for Jerusalem, but it's also for Judea and it's also for Samaria and it's also for the ends of the earth. It's for everybody. That's how big this new covenant is. And so for the Jews, I can imagine a little bit of like, yeah, that's cool and I'm excited about this message, but also it was kind of fun to be special and for generation after generation after generation, this has been part of what bound us together as a people and it kind of feels like that's going away. And then in verse 26, Paul says, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that the message of salvation has been sent. This is still the culmination of our story. Jesus was still a Jew. We're still important. We're still a part of this, guys. It's still us. He's translating. He's reading the room. He knows them well enough to understand the journey they must be on, and he meets them in that journey. In verse 32 and 33, the whole, the whole message turns. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, in Jesus. Guys, do you remember that story I told you of the Jewish people? The culmination and fulfillment of that story is the person of Jesus. And then he unpacks why this is so different from the old covenant and draws a juxtaposition between old and new covenant that nobody in the room would have missed. Therefore, my friends, verse 38, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free, which by the way, is a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. 
Guys, you know that feeling we all have where it never feels like enough, where we can't be set free? Fellow Jews, you know this feeling that we have together. Guess what? Jesus fixed it. Jesus fulfilled it. The old covenant was a start, but it wasn't enough, but the new covenant is here. He quotes Psalms and Isaiah and Habakkuk. He's quoting writings that they're familiar with and authority that matters to them and references that they will get. And then despite some opposition from the leadership, verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Verse 49, the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. It worked. But this sermon gets even more powerful when it's juxtaposed against another sermon. He gives just three chapters later. So turn to Acts 17, verse 16. Same guy, same eternal truth, completely different sermon, completely different translation. Now, so he was in Antioch in a Jewish context. Now he's in Athens. He's in a city that doesn't know Jesus yet a city full of the types of behaviors that the old covenant forbade, but especially idol worship. The city's full of idols to other gods that are not our God. And there's even an altar to an unknown God, a catch-all, the great God TBD. Just in case we don't know this one. Paul knows God pretty well at this point. He knows that God is not a big fan of idol worship. It's kind of hard to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength when you're sharing that heart, soul, mind, and strength with another God. He knows. So Pharisee Paul, legalist Paul, pre-encounter with Jesus Paul, Saul, I think we know how he would have reacted. I think we know the sermon he would have preached. I think we know what his opening line would have been. People of Athens, I can see that you are a very rebellious people. I can see the idols that you've put up. God is pissed. You should be scared. His judgment is coming. Saul out. (laughs) And then secretly, he would have been hoping and praying that he got to be a part of whatever judgment God was bringing to these rebellious pagan people of Athens. But after encountering Jesus and embracing the new covenant, let's look now at this translation. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And this part is so important because Paul didn't show up in the light of the new covenant and go, who cares, guys? Just love each other. Don't worry about sin. It's fine. God doesn't care about sin anymore. New covenant, no. Sin is still sin. Right is still right. Wrong is still wrong. True is still true. False is still false. But Paul knows that we love God because he loved us first. The obedience, the behavior change that people see in us, if it's going to last, if it's gonna go deep, it has to be connected to a transformational experience with the overwhelming grace that God has shown us. That is why people change. Behavior change by itself is boring and petty and small. It doesn't matter. It doesn't stick. It's why you start your diet and you're on it for two weeks. Paul knows they need to encounter Jesus if things are going to change. So instead of being mad at them, instead of saying, I can see that you are a very rebellious people, how does he open in verse 22? And this, as a, as a, as a reforming legalist, personally, multiple times this week. It's been hard for me to get through this. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. People of Athens, I can see how hard you're trying. People of Athens, I know that the way you're missing the point is different from the way I was missing the point, but I can see that it's motivated by the same thing that's common to all of us, to know God and be known by him. I can see that that's all you want and that's all that I want too. I see your hustle, I respect it. I know what you're after. In 
In verse 23, he references the altar to the unknown God. And he says, guys, guess what? I can tell you who that is. I can tell that even as you put these altars together to the other gods, you could tell that you were missing something, that you were almost there, but you weren't quite there, but you didn't know what it was. Guess what? I know what it was. I'll tell you who sits on that throne. In verse 28, I love this. He quotes a popular philosopher of their time, the Stoic named Eratus. And central to his teaching was that we are all God's offspring. Paul goes, that dude's onto something. Paul goes, Imago Dei. Paul goes, we are all made in the image of God. Wait, you're close. I can see you're zeroing in on the answer. I know that there's this thing you guys are all talking about and I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna connect it to Jesus so that you can understand it. In, in, in Antioch, he was quoting Isaiah and Psalms and Habakkuk and telling the story of the Jewish people. Here, he's saying, this is the thing you're all talking about. Let me connect that to Jesus so that you can understand it. Same tactic, writings they're familiar with, authority that matters to them, references they'll get. Same thing he was doing in Antioch, but the outcome, the end result could not have been any more different. Paul is, is filled with empathy for these people. He cares enough and he listens enough and he pays attention enough to learn how to say something in a way that they can hear it. He says, you don't have to come to me. I will go to you. In the same way that Jesus came to me, now I come to you. Jesus had to knock me down and explain it to me because I was missing the point. He had to come find me. So I'll come find you. And I'm gonna come say it in a way that you can hear it. I'll do the work of figuring that out because I love you. Because what could be more important? So how can we get good at this? Because when it goes wrong... It goes really, really wrong. And you'd think in an age of Google Translate, we wouldn't have big translation mistakes anymore, but I'm glad we still do so I can share these funny mistranslations with you. Let me point to you this first one that I found online. I don't know about you guys, but when I am in the market for some chicken murder, I do not want to pay full price. I'm looking for some sort of coupon or sale. I'm going to go to Bob's sale of chicken murder. Uh, this next one, it's, listen, sometimes truth in advertising is, I like to think this wasn't a mistranslation. I like to think that these people were like, no, we have a very specific clientele here. If you are low maintenance or even mid maintenance, you go somewhere else. Uh, this one, I don't know why it makes me laugh so much. I just imagine they're like, listen, when you get here, you're going to want to, because it looks amazing. You cannot strictly prohibited. <laughs> this one's just true. I don't know how you feel, but, <laughs> or like it should be. It is for me. It's like, hey, listen, you're going to go to the bathroom while you're in there. And then uh, this last one. So obviously these are automatic doors and they're saying, don't try to open or close them manually. But <laughs> Instead, now, they've created this person in my brain, Manuel, who's just torturing them. They're just like, freaking Manuel keeps running around and opening and closing these doors. Ugh, Manuel is the worst. Anyway, uh, so, so when we mistranslate the stupid stuff, the worst thing that can happen is you end up on BuzzFeed. But what about stuff that actually matters? How do we avoid mistranslating Jesus? I think there's two questions here that'll help, that are helpful for us. Number one, who am I translating for? And number two, how am I translating for them specifically? So to the first question, I think we have a personal answer and we have a corporate answer. The personal answer is the same answer that Jesus gave when he was asked, who is my neighbor? And he told the story of the Good Samaritan. You're translating for everyone that you come in contact with, everyone that you're connected to, everybody who lives in your house. Everybody who's at your work. Everybody who would answer a text if you texted them or pick up the phone when you called. Everybody who is in your Zumba class. Everybody who pick a thing. Your neighbor. That's who you're translating for. And I bet you it's a longer list than you think. So what can we do to make sure that we actually know these people? To make sure that these people trust us. To make sure that we are a safe place for these people. 
so that in the right moment, we might be invited, like Paul was, to have a conversation about something that really matters. So here's a small example, but it matters to me so much. I love Liverpool Football Club. Love it. Obsessed to a, probably an unhealthy degree. I've been to Anfield, which is their stadium in Liverpool. Every time they come to the U.S., I've been to New York to see them play. I've, whenever they come to the West Coast, I've seen them play. The amount of Saturdays that I've been up at four in the morning to watch a game, it's illogical and stupid and wonderful, and I love it. It's the best. My mom did not grow up playing soccer, did not grow up watching soccer. Frankly, on her own, I think could give a rip about a soccer team that plays 5,000 miles from where she lives. But my mom DVRs every game. She follows Liverpool-related stuff on Twitter. She texts me before and after big games. Sometimes, multiple times, she has texted me a piece of breaking news related to Liverpool before I found it myself, and I am simultaneously, in the same moment, so happy and appreciative of my mom and filled with shame that my mom knew this before me somehow, am I still a real fan? When they came to town, we all went, and the most important thing about this picture that I would like to draw your attention to is the food stuck in my dad's teeth. <laughs> and so listen, if you're watching online, do not screenshot this and put it all over the internet. Please don't. Leave it up for a minute just so people can have a minute to not screenshot it and spread it all over the internet and tag Cornerstone Web online. So Liverpool might seem dumb and stupid and small to you, but it doesn't to me. And because it's not to me, it's also not to my mom. Because she loves me enough to get into the things that I'm into, just because I'm into them. Just because she wants to continually be building credibility with me, connections in to me, so that when something important comes up, I love that they've still left this up. It's great. Anyway, just write just a little bit of floss, Dad. Anyway, just, just because she wa if something important comes up, she wants to make sure that her voice is as loud as possible in my ear and that I feel as safe as possible bringing it to her. So what if you did the same thing with some people in your life that you love that you're called to? Your, your niece who's going through a hard time, maybe she's really into anime. Time to get into anime. Just so that you can connect with her, just so you feel safe with her. Maybe your buddy at work is way into the XFL. Time to become a big Battlehawks fan, I guess. It might sound like dumb and small, but there might be someone at your work who's way into The Bachelor. I can see people shaking their head. I think that might be the line. <laughs> uh, seriously though, like it, maybe you need to watch The Bachelor just so you have something to connect with her over. Because you might not know the, what she's going through. And maybe it starts as a conversation about watching The Bachelor and how you watch with your husband and then a month later you're talking about something else and she goes, do you guys still watch The Bachelor together? Yeah, because me and my husband don't really do much of anything together right now. And then you're like, oh, okay, it's happening. This is the moment. Now, they're opening up to me. Sometimes I think we have this idea of what it means to like share the gospel with someone. And it's this moment where I'm sitting at my desk and someone comes up to me and they're like, Kevin, I'm ready to talk about Jesus now. And I have a list of 27 questions, and if you can answer all of them correctly, I will come to church with you, and you will get 50 Christian points. <laughs> and it never happens that way. That's not how people work. The way it happens usually is that someone's going through something hard, and then they lean on the people who've earned the right to be leaned on. That's it. So we should be doing everything we can even if it seems small and meaningless and stupid, to make sure that we are safe for the people in our lives. So that's a personal answer. But there's also a corporate answer because we, as individuals, are translating for our neighbor, but then we as Cornerstone, all of us, are translating the eternal message of Jesus, the way of love for the 2020 East Bay. And then we as like capital C Church are translating for the entire world. So there's a corporate answer here too. And the message that I would like to give 
is that the corporate answer is nothing more, their corporate translation is nothing more than the sum total of all of our individual translations, right? You just do your thing with your group of people, you, 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 and then it all builds and then we're good. And I think that used to be true, and it's still kind of true, but the internet kind of changed all of that. Because the way one Christian acts on a very public internet can affect a lot of people all at once. When someone hears enough Christians, especially online, lead with God's rules instead of God's love, of course they think we serve a God of rules. What other conclusion could they come to? I hope you feel that burden. I think that's a healthy fear to have. Paul models face-to-face in the room, because I've spent time with you, because I understand your specific culture, I can look past whatever behavior seems weird to me, and rather than rebuking it, I can go to the source of that and say, I see that in every way you are very religious, rather than I can see that in every way you are very rebellious. And too often, the way Christians act online is a rules first you are rebellious here is my rebuke your behavior is offensive to me personally don't do that in front of my children small petty resistible gospel and of course people want none of it i wouldn't want any of it you wouldn't want any of it just listen to the stories people tell when they leave the church on thursday i was getting my hair cut and before you la- before you laugh When you get to this stage, they're all so precious that you want only a professional to deal with them. (laughs) So I'm getting my hair cut. And we're chatting. I've this person's never cut my hair. And she's like, what are you doing this weekend? And I'm like, I'm actually talking at my church. Oh, cool, whatever, chit-chat, chit-chat. Ten minutes later, it's quiet for a second. And she's like, you know, I used to go to church. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. She's like, yeah, I actually used to go to Cornerstone when it was across the freeway a little bit, and then I went to college, and I actually joined a Bible study for the first time in my life. And it was good for a few weeks, but then one week, the Bible study leader went on this whole rant about sexual purity and that everybody who's ever had sex is, is unacceptable to God and that God hates you. And don't even get me started about gay people. Those are the worst. Those are the ones God hates the worst. This is the abomination. She got up and left. She's like, and I've never been back. One person. Think about all the people that were involved with that person's journey towards Jesus. People I don't know, people I've never met that were translating for her to the part where she was like, oh, I kind of feel comfortable in church. Oh, I kind of feel comfortable in a Bible study. One person blew it. And I don't know if she'll be back. It's scary and it should be. But the more we orient our public faith, public faith around the person of Jesus, the more attractive we are. So if you're feeling burdened right now by this responsibility, I have good news for you. The key to all of this is the Holy Spirit. Right at the end of Jesus' time here, he said something weird, which is pretty much what he did the whole time he was here. And in John 16, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, it's better for you that I leave. And his disciples are like, no, it's not. Stay forever. He's like, no, no, I'm sending my Holy Spirit to be your friend and your translator. What he was saying is you used to experience God in a place, in the temple. Right now you experience God as a person in me, Jesus, but what is coming is that you get to experience God constantly with the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10 says it like this. This is the message. I'm not gonna put it on screen, just listen to the words. The Holy Spirit confirms this. This new plan, it isn't going to be written on paper. It isn't going to be chiseled in stone. This time, I'm writing out the plan in them. I'm carving it on the lining of their hearts. The gospel is written on the lining of our hearts. I love it. And don't miss the implication of that, church, and that's this. It is not just Cornerstone's job to translate the way of Jesus for your friends and for your kids and for your coworkers. It's your job. The old covenant is over. Jesus died. The veil tore. The holy of holies broke out. The spirit fell. God doesn't live here anymore. Hallelujah. 
He's in here. He's with us. He's with you. The gospel is written on our hearts. There are no gatekeepers anymore. There are no experts anymore. There isn't, our job is not to introduce people to the people who know Jesus. Our job is to be the people who know Jesus, even when it's messy, even when it's confusing, even when we mess up. Jesus chose us to be his translators in the way we act, in the way we live. He didn't choose me as a guy standing up in front of you. He didn't choose my dad as Pastor Steve. He didn't choose a priest. He chose you as an imperfect, perfect messenger of the way of love. It is your job. And if that feels overwhelming, amen. If that feels, because it's exciting, right? But it's also like, oh no. I think the reason that it feels scary is because we're so afraid to mess it up. But listen to Jesus in Matthew 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door is open to you. And if you've been in church, you've heard that verse before. But I want you to hear it again and listen for what it doesn't say. It does not say, when you figure it all out, I will be happy with you. Once you check all of the boxes, I will be with you and answer you. It doesn't say I will finally use you. Once you take all of this complicated, confusing mess where the divine meets the human and the infinite meets the finite and it's weird and confusing, but once you wrap your brain around all of it, then I will use you. It doesn't say that. We've talked about the new covenant for weeks now and we've talked about it in the context of of, of intention versus action and how Jesus goes, you've heard it said, don't murder. Well, today I say to you, if you're looking at somebody with anger in your heart, you're already doing it. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Today I say to you, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, you're kind of already there. Intention is what matters in the new covenant. And I would encourage you to also apply that to knowing and seeking Jesus. Just knock, just ask, just seek, just try. God is not on high waiting for you to mess up so that he can smite you. Jesus showed up and smashed that whole misconception. We do not serve a God who set up a minefield and then put a blindfold on us and then said, walk through it. And sometimes I think that's what we're afraid of. Questions are okay. In fact, if you don't have questions, you're probably not paying close enough attention. Doubts are okay. Two steps forward and one step back is okay. The cross is so big, guys. Forgiveness is so big. Sometimes I think we're so afraid to really ingest and and then spread the message of Jesus because we've convinced ourselves that life is nothing more than a high-stakes theology test. It's not. That would be cruel, and God is not cruel. So we just wade into these translations with the limited information we have, asking what does love require, saying, God, will you help me not mess this up, please? I know for some reason I'm the one that you want to have this conversation. I don't think I know how to do it, but it'd be great if you would help me not mess it up. If you feel overwhelmed, me too. If you feel like you suck at evangelism, me too. If you're afraid of hurting someone's feelings, me too. If you're afraid of offending someone, me too. And guess what? Paul too. That dude that we just studied that gave those two amazing sermons that like showed us the way how to do this. Listen to his words to the Corinthians. This is what I'm gonna leave you with. Again, I'm not gonna put it up on the screen. Just listen to the words that Paul is saying to the Corinthians. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed the testimony. I didn't know what to do, so I resolved to know nothing when I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. Ever felt that way when you're trying to have a conversation about Jesus with someone? My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Ever done that? But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so your faith would not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Nothing except Jesus and him crucified. That's the greatest evangelist the world world has ever seen. Saying, if I just focus on nothing 
but the person of Jesus and the fact that he loves us endlessly, I'll probably do my best and not mess it up. That's my North Star. That's what I'll come back to. And that is the crux of our message to the world, guys. Let's not confuse it. Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not add a bunch of other things to it. Just this good news, a God that loves us so much. He made us and then he came to fix something that was broken because he couldn't stand not being with us. And his love is so overwhelming that we have no choice but to spread it with other people and we're gonna be with Jesus forever. Just that. The rest is just details. Love you guys.